Hello and welcome to another installment of Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host. It is April 19th, 2023. And as always, we have Arusha Paris from O'Neill Global Advisors joining us as he does every week, except for last week he ditched us, but you know, that's okay. We won't hold it against him. How you doing, Arusha? I'm doing well, Justin. It's good to be back. Good, good. Good to have you. And also, speaking of coming back, we also have Matt Caruso from Caruso Insights uh, rejoining us on the show. Uh, he's He's been on a number of times, uh, and he's been on on with uh, with us at on IBD Live. Uh, great to have you again, Matt. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's, it's wonderful to be back here with you and uh, Arusha. I get both of you at the same time here this time. Right, exactly. There have been, uh, in fact, I think the first time that I took over from Arusha, uh, you know, more than a year ago, uh, I think Matt was my first guest. So it was like right. the first time it was on my own and, and Matt was with me. So uh, you, you, you hold a special place in my heart, Matt, uh, <laughs> just because of that. So uh, today, as we always do, we're going to cover some of the market action that's been going on lately. And also, Matt's going to kind of dive into one of his favorite indicators. A little bit of looking at the highs and the lows and what that tells us about the market, its breadth. And then, of course, we'll take a look at a few stocks. So uh, how about we get right into it? And uh, where do you want to start, Matt? Do you want to start with the NASDAQ, the S&P 500? Sure. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Um, okay. I think the NASDAQ's really been the story of uh, a few stocks leading with some you know, pretty strong rotations internally. So uh, the main tool we'll talk about later, highs and lows, just been showing this been really weak breadth, which is, mm -hmm. especially if we're coming off of a bear market low, which, you know, that's the assumption we can run with from the October lows. Typically, the start of a bull is very broad based. You know, we've had a washout and there's a lot of strength. So we're still lacking that. So I, I kind of view this as two ways. Either we need to get a lot of the market to get up and running with the general indexes and join the uh, mega caps that have been leading. Or I think there's probably going to be a pause in, the, in large caps and we ease a, a bit lower. We're really stuck in this uh, kind of uh, neutral zone at the moment. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I think back, and we were talking about this on IBD Live today, but I think back to like the 2003 bull market. This was, you mm -hmm. know, after a, a pretty devastating dot-com crash. Uh, so mm -hmm. the NASDAQ was down 79%. And I remember the NASDAQ did bottom in October 2002, but in, whenever we go back and we talk about the bull market, we always talk about March 2003 right. as being the start. So is this is this something that you've seen a few times where it's it takes this long from a bottom for the market to really kind of uh, get going? So there are sometimes those discrepancies. It's odd. It's rare because typically, mm -hmm. you know, typically bottoms are more of an event, you know, fear driven. You get a kind of a climax where most things bottom. And especially mm -hmm. growth, growth will lead coming out. I mean, again, when we say market, it's, it's you know one of those terms where you know we think we know what it means, but it depends how you slice it up. So, uh, you know, the indexes have become so heavily weighted to just yeah. a few large caps. It doesn't always give a good view depending on what kind of strategy you're running. So, it, you know, it is there are those those kind of rare occasions, but regardless, if you're going to get broad participation, you have to see that start to kick in. So we, we just really haven't seen it yet. So it may come, it may click in. And that's the interesting thing about the market. Sometimes you can look at market uplegs that have these incredible moves. Stocks are flying, they're running, mm -hmm. but the market's up 20%. Other times the market's up 20% and there's just so little participation. I think a lot has to do with investor, se investor sentiment, how uh, you know what risk preferences are at the moment. And uh, right now, everything is still very conservative, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we might... We we're, we'll probably get a better idea in the next couple of weeks, right? Because it's it's a narrow that narrow rally, as you mentioned, Matt, uh, and a number of those key large cap tech stocks are going to be reporting in the yeah. next couple of weeks. Yeah, and and there's another. So I think the two elements that are going to be really important coming up is is one like you just mentioned those earnings, which are going to be key. I know Tesla was out today, and it seems to right. have disappointed as we're we're speaking. Uh, another major major discrepancy going on right now is what the Federal Reserve is saying. And what the market's pricing in. So, um, you know, this really shows if you look at uh, like the, the forward curve that there's going to be cuts coming later this year. However, the Federal Reserve is saying, hey, we're staying at 5% or higher for the remainder of the year. So who's right and who's wrong? If the market has to kind of reprice into what the Fed is saying, that's going to be some weight as well. So I think we need these two really big question marks to be answered before we get kind of that runaway move. Mm -hmm. And to, to the point of earnings, I guess what we've been kind of talking about lately is uh, that, yes, there are still those inflation fears and what the Fed has to do in order to tamp down that inflation. But 
I think it's kind of shifting a little bit of the focus more to those recession fears as well. I mean, that's been in the background this whole time. I mean, the yield curve has been inverted for, I, I feel like forever now. Um, and that's usually a, a sign of a recession to come. And so this has been something that's been on people's minds, but is this, is this earnings season a little bit more important to kind of see that guidance going forward and whether or not uh, companies are seeing recession? I mean, we had, uh, JP, uh, JP Morgan and, you know, Jamie Dimon saying, look, it's, you know, he, he's still seeing a, a strong economy and, you know, maybe a minor recession. The Fed keeps on pointing to the soft landing um, or, or even a, a transitory uh, recession, you know, kind of using, you know, the Too same soon. language they used for Too inflation. <laughs> right. Um, but what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, again, I, and I think this is why a lot of stocks, more speculative names are not running away because there is this big uncertainty. Again, what the Fed is saying and what the market is saying are two different things. So, I mean, mm -hmm. the inverted yield curve is very much uh, saying by the market that they expect recession, expect forward growth to be to be weakening. So here you have the Fed coming out saying we're keeping rates at five or higher. Uh, there's no recession. And then you have, the, you have the market pricing in rate cuts and recessionary probability. So... Uh, I, I think definitely earnings are going to be important. We want to see also with inflation how much companies could pass that on to the consumer, how much the consumer will absorb, how much that will affect margins and, and earnings. So these are really important questions. Um, I, I, th I think the most important question is, you know, has inflation been beaten? I think so. I think that's why October may have been the absolute bear market lows. That's the underlying basis I'm going by. But it doesn't mean that we're up, up, and away. And we can chop, mm -hmm. we can have a bad market where people are, waiting for the slowdown, looking for direction. And we end up in this kind of uh, no man's land here where we don't quite know if we're going to take off or pull back further. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, we, yeah, and, and really getting back to the earnings, we, we might need to go through some of these bad uh, mm -hmm. numbers and things like that. For instance, CDW, right? They, they came out today and they, uh, they pre-announced actually and uh, said that, you know, things are slowing down for them and that affected a number of names that affected Cisco, it affected uh, Arista Networks. And so you almost have these kind of traps that are kind of lurking out there now. And now you have this other variable where you could have more companies starting to pre-announce. Yeah, and I think you bring up a good point, uh, Arusha, too, because you can get these pre-announcements. We can kind of get these downside surprises. So like the way I look at the market is, you know, I'm not really so concerned about predicting what the Nasdaq will do next. I really want a good, re re you know, reward for my risk. I'm putting money out there. Uh, you know, I don't need to always be invested. That's my position. That's not everyone's position. So if I am going to be out there and, and I have this risk of like, you know, either recession comes in or we get these downside surprises by earnings or, or guidance by uh, analysts, there's no real upside. Nothing is running away. Nothing's moving hot. So it's, it's what am I getting for the risk that I'm taking on right now? So that's kind of just forced me into a higher cash position because I just don't see a compelling, you know, risk reward setup. And, um, and yeah, you, you, like you said, you mentioned today, you come in and you have some small gains and you get whacked with a, a drop because someone's, you know, uh, reducing their estimates or their guidance. And it's, it's a painful market. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I feel like it's actually a little bit tougher. I mean, 2022, I mean, you would assume because the S and P 500 was down so much and the NASDAQ was down so much, you would assume that that would have been, a you know a, a harder market but i feel like since the yeah. bottom has actually been harder it was pretty easy to stay kind of out uh through most of 2022 because the the downtrend was so obvious but now that we're kind of above the 200 day moving average line uh we're kind of going back and forth a little bit it, it seems like it's a little bit more tricky because it can yeah. it can suck you in sometimes and uh you know make you think oh is is this is this the move is this the start of something uh and then you know as 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 you mo mentioned just a moment ago there's all of these stocks that it kind of feels like they pulled the rug out from under you and you know you're 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 kind of left holding the bag yeah you know i think if you're a buy and hold or you're just someone who's always positioned you feel better this year because markets have come off of those december lows and some of those were big drops because of tax loss selling but mm -hmm. someone who's playing a, a more active strategy it's been a much more kind of frustrating environment because, I mean, stocks basically sold right into the end of the year off of tax loss. And some names kind of rocketed straight up from there. And so it's kind of hard to play catch up when markets go from their virtually, you know, bear market lows to kind of straight up and then with yeah. narrow leadership. 
So it's kind of, you kind of have to be right at the right time in the right select few names, or you're on the outside looking in. And, and when the market's kind of, you know, dropping in a bear market, even if you're in cash, you feel good because, hey, at least I'm doing better than, mar than the market. Right. But then there's times where the market's up at 15%. You say, hey, I'm, I'm up 5% or up to, I'm, I'm underperforming. You know, so it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that pressure we, we give ourselves with the indexes. And again, depending, if you're trying to just outperform the index at your benchmark, it's one thing. If you're running an active strategy where you're, you're just looking to maximize returns at the right time, sometimes the indexes are not the best benchmark, especially when you have these narrow, large cap mm -hmm. leadership. So I, I think you have to also always kind of, realize what am I benchmarking myself against and, 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 you know, think, is it appropriate or not? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, maybe we could take a look at the S and P 500. Are you seeing anything different here? Um, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the NASDAQ was the clear runaway winner at the mm -hmm. beginning of the year. Um, and now they're kind of looking a little bit more closer together, I guess. Uh, and and it, it seems like the S&P 500 has shown a little bit more strength. Some of that has been helped by some of the energy, uh, some of the other commodities. I mean, we've had gold, you know, go on a run. Um, what's what's your take on the difference between these two indexes? So my my main you know premise is, is we're in this range bound market until we get a catalyst. So if you're range bound, the worst thing you can do is buy on strength because you buy into strength and you get pushed back down. So Seeing where the S and P is rallied up to, for me again, the the reward for my risk, unless we get a catalyst to really push this market higher, that could be either downside surprises on inflation, uh, maybe some better than expected earnings through the the earnings season could can kind of reassure investors. Unless we can get those catalysts, I don't see a again big downside like a breaking of the October lows. But can can we kind of like kind of push back down to the February you know March lows? I think that's possible. Um, and you can see the volume on this up leg recently at the end here is it's been very lackluster, very yeah. low. So it's, it's just a slow grind higher. It's a part, sometimes when the market doesn't have a lot of direction, positioning is the most important thing. So a lot of people weren't positioned to the long side or had a lot of puts or, or, or were positioned more conservatively. And that alone repositioning kind of helps to levitate markets. But that doesn't mean it's a runaway move. So I think that's the environment we're in. This comes about every once in a while. Every you know, it's part of the economic cycle. You hit this kind of trough of of inactivity on the markets, and I feel that's just what we're stuck in. When when I was a day trader, market making, this kind of reminds me of the summer months. You know, I used to try and mm, do the yeah. best in July, but July just isn't October. You you want to you want to get something out of it that's just not there. Uh -huh. And this kind of you know, for position trading now in this respect, same thing. It's like we want this runaway move, but we need that catalyst. What's going to kind of break us higher uh, substantially? Yeah, and mm -hmm. so the key is, you know, when when you're when it's not in your favor, don't force it, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. it even gets back to kind of talking about the benchmark and, and things like that. I mean, if you're an individual investor, you know, you, you you don't necessarily always have to benchmark yourself against S and P or something. I mean, if it's not in your favor, if if the the odds aren't really in your favor at that point. You know, don't push it. You know, take advantage of being an individual investor and and waiting on the sidelines until the environment really gets better and and you get those fat pitches that that we look for. Well, you know, it's like I've had myself like uh, I, I you know I trade actively a little more aggressively, but where the Nasdaq's rallied twenty five percent and I've had triple digit returns. There's other periods mm -hmm. of time where the market's gone up twenty percent and I have single digit returns. So it, mm -hmm. it's like you know. That, that index doesn't always represent um, what's going on. And, and I know in the later segment, we're going to talk about net highs, net lows. I think that's a much better uh, way to analyze the market for the active investor. So again, it's one of those things, we, you know, you could read in a book and you say, hey, look, patience and wait for the right market. In real yeah. time, you know, one that's day true. goes by, one week goes by and you get that itch because, I mean, everyone <laughs> trades because they want to make money. But, you know, the, the real secret is we all love what we do. I mean, I, I do this for money, but also it's because I love to do it. So kind of sitting there and waiting never feels too good in no. real time. In the books, it makes sense, but in real time, you don't really want to follow them. <laughs> but you have to listen to the market though, too, because you have to look and say, look, if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, if I'm out of sync, if I'm wrong on five trades in a row and I'm, I'm, I'm just getting chopped to death, you, there's a point where you kind of have to take a step back and say something's off. Maybe it's me, mm -hmm. maybe it's the market, but something's off. Well, that's, that's the other thing about this market too. That's I think to Justin's point about 2022 being easier yeah. is that in this market, it's not bad enough where everything's breaking down. So it's mm -hmm. always easy to point to, oh, look at that stock had a great week. So you feel like, why didn't I cash that stock? But if you're right. truthful with yourself and you see like, hey, for every one I would have caught, there's seven that maybe would have stopped me out or what. I mean, it's really that net 
uh, overall return you got you got to factor for yourself. So yeah, it doesn't mean you have to be 100% cash, but I, I I dial down my intensity. That's the way I respond. Like I slow myself down because sometimes you know a series of putting out too much exposure on strength and then getting out on weakness and this chop can be really painful. And and like I said, this environment's tough because the indexes are up. You feel like maybe you might be underperforming, and like there are a few stocks that are doing great. Yeah. But, you know, uh, hey, you know, nailing that one stock, which is the stock of the week, which then underperforms next week is not an easy thing to do. That's for sure. Yeah. And especially I, I think that's a good point that the there's been a lack of, I guess, trending. You know, you, you have kind of your flavor of the week, but then it seems like it just shifts to something else uh, very quickly. And so a lot of these moves just haven't been lasting as long as we would typically see when you are in a full fledged bull. Especially the last three weeks i think you can draw a flat line on the past three weeks of closes and this is gone i mean already the be you know january was not bad and then we had the banking panic which seemed to have come in and left us but now especially mm -hmm. the last three weeks i mean we've been range bound for a year but the last two weeks have been incredibly quiet i mean you can take a look at the vix this is the first time we're breaking i think i saw a 16 handle on it today which wow. is, is extremely low wow. um yeah so that's so that's just really telling you i mean i mean someone's going to be right or wrong really soon i mean we're gonna we're gonna we're not gonna stay here forever <laughs> right. um, you know but, but sometimes you know you have the uh the ability to say hey, i'm gonna wait to see which is the right direction i was reading market wizards recently uh bruce kovner was you know billionaire trader and he would say sometimes there's environments where i can make a really bullish case and a bearish case and i kind of let the market sort it out and, and and i buy after the move starts uh but you know he's like part of my job is to kind of envision different realities of the world that can be and then after I kind of wait for that marginal data that will kind of confirm which way the move will actually happen. So that's where I feel we are right now. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think that's a good place to kind of end this segment. And you already kind of teed us up. You talked about this indicator that you look at, the, the net highs versus net lows. Uh, so when we come back, we're going to dive into that indicator and tell, uh, see, see what it can tell us about the market's direction and when things might improve. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pires, a portfolio manager over at O'Neill Global Advisors. And also joining us on the show today is Matt Caruso from Caruso Insights. A lot of great educational material that you have uh, over there on Caruso Insights, uh, some great stuff and some great indicators uh, that you've come up with. So one of the indicators, Matt, that you're talking about today is kind of this new highs versus new lows. And tell, tell me why this is useful. So I use this in a number of ways. I use this to judge trend. Uh, mm -hmm. It also helps me to judge environment. So essentially all it is each day, we're taking a look at the number of stocks making 52-week highs versus the, num the number of stocks making 52-week lows on the NASDAQ composite. You can do it for the NYSE as well, but I feel for more speculative types of names, the NASDAQ is the place you want to look at. And um, you can see here at the bottom of the chart, uh, when you have a red number, that means overall there's more lows than highs. And when there's a green number, there's more highs than lows. And this mm -hmm. is just a great tool because if you kind of take a long-term view, bull markets are associated with more stocks making new highs and bear markets with more stocks making new lows. But what I, there's a few things that I really particularly like about this tool is one, um, it helps me to get a good sense of how aggressive I should be in the market. So I, I also look at the fall through day to kind of tell me, are we at the start of a new trend? Mm -hmm. But the fall through day is really an event. You get this one day signal uh, like that, you know, Bill, you said, you know, our institutions getting involved in the market and it helps to kind of reorient your, your mindset and, and your, your positioning. But then especially environments like this, where like you walk into this chop, well, at what point is it no longer valid? At what point are we just in another, you know, uh, environment where we're not getting this kind of follow through and the follow through, they maybe mark the low, but it's not really telling you how, how good of an environment it is. So you're looking at the net highs and net lows. It's a process. Every day we see how many stocks are advancing, how many stocks are falling. And 52-week highs and lows are an important data point because any day you can have a stock go up 2%, fall 2%. If a stock's at 52-week highs, I mean, someone's willing to pay higher today than they have over the past year. Or same, you know, 52-week mm -hmm. low, someone's saying, look, I need to get out of this stock, even though there's the lowest price of the past year. So it's someone who has um, a real intention to buy or sell when you get those, those prints and those stocks. That's why I think it's, it's a valuable data point. 
Um, and you can see what's what's really odd and strange about this current environment is despite having this kind of rally up in the NASDAQ, we haven't been able to get to, to net highs. Yeah. And yeah. what makes it even more odd um, is that the NASDAQ's down, I think at this point over the past year, maybe seven or eight percent. So you're only down seven or eight percent over the past 52 weeks, yet you can't get um, more than 30 or 40 stocks to make 52 week highs out of almost 5,000 stocks. So that's kind of showed you how range bound, the lack of leadership. So this kind of gives with this one tool, you get this insight into the market of what's the trend, uh, how broad based is it, um, and, and how much net progress is going on. So it's just a really good glimpse into the market. So I have kind of a personal rule. Um, whenever we're kind of like with this red background means we have three or more consecutive days of net lows. I try and keep my, my positioning to like cash to up to 40% invested. If we get like a white background means we're like back and forth between net highs and lows. And, you know, I, I leave myself the 40 to 70% invested. If we get this upward trend of, uh, of net highs, I, I tell myself I should be maybe as close to fully invested as possible. Of course, we need to see actual things to buy or sell, but that's kind of like the, the, the ranges I give myself. So it helps to also kind of guide my exposure levels. And I, I found it's been incredibly helpful to get a, a real glimpse of not just what's the index doing, but what are most stocks doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's kind of interesting because you can see the January 6th fall today that we had to start the year, right. and we had a number of net new highs there, and it was all kind of confirming, and things were feeling uh, pretty good there, and there, there was, there was uh, some decent participation. Uh, but yeah, this this time around, it, it is very strange, and it almost it, it's almost telling us that, hey, there aren't that many stocks that... Uh, the institutions are comfortable being in, so they're just kind of running towards kind of the yeah. the classic ones that didn't necessarily weren't necessarily doing that well uh, to start the year, right? They they've only started to come up over the last uh, month and a half. Yeah, and I think that's why this tool is so helpful because even being so close to the lows, I mean, this is virtually the bear market lows, but this really gives us a good viewpoint into what's underneath the surface. You can see mm -hmm. right away we got to net highs, and, and in January, I mean, I had a, a good January which got a little eaten up by February. Uh, but this just really shows like this was a great time to participate. And this has just been a tough market. And if you go back to other environments, like we'll go back to, I think, 2003 to your point before. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, let me just kind of bring that up here. Oh, and you can oh, kind wow. of see like, yeah, I mean, this was off the October 2002 bottom. That's really Internally, you already had a lot of strength. And and you can see not only did you have this trend continue in 03, but you saw it broaden out. So, you know, I look at this market can, and, can you, you know, take, take, can you scroll back even further to see like the bear market uh, back earlier? Yeah. So you can oh look at that. I mean, even back then, when yeah. the markets were coming in, you were starting to see there there was there was more buying, yeah, more value type of buying and things like that. And just very quickly, for those of you who are listening to this episode, go to investors.com slash podcast, because then you can really see the the chart and the, the new highs, uh, new lows that we're looking at. And, and is this new highs, new lows? Uh, is this is this uh, exchange specific or is this over the, the whole market? So you, you can set as you wish. I have it just to okay. NASDAQ now. You can do each one or combine them together. There's a tool I built on trading view here. But one thing that's really interesting about this 2002 period where you can see the index coming down, but we had this actually even like broadening net highs here. Yeah, um, I, I couldn't you, be more shocked to see that yeah, actually. You know, yeah. so I was studying this recently. If you take a look at, let's say, a leader of the time or like a, a, spec, a more speculative name of the time, and you see we put Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, you'll see like over that period of time here, uh, like this actually, let me just adjust this chart here so it's a little, a little easier to see. Despite the, the Nasdaq being weak over this this leg down, Amazon Amazon did bottom in, in you know September of 01 and was starting its rally despite kind of the indexes rolling over. So I, I found that the net highs is really the best viewpoint into what more speculative growth names will do than the indexes themselves. You can mm -hmm. see actually when we got to this kind of like white background, when we got back to kind of net lows in June of 02, then Amazon kind of went into another higher like basing period. Um, and then finally, when we got back to the highs, we continued that trend. But if you would have been looking just at the NASDAQ, you would have said, oh, this is an awful market. But actually, there were opportunities. And this is kind of like a 180 view of that. We have the market going up, but you have net lows. So like the market looks good now, but internally it's poor. Like in 02, 
the market looked terrible, but some stocks were working in growth land. So yeah, uh, where was it looking bad for for the 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 lows? Where where did that really switch? Because even like in May, it looks like. So if you go back even further, Matt, just yeah. This was really around, uh, I guess, nine eleven here in. 01. Okay, but even mm -hmm. before that, it's pretty amazing that there were underneath the surface it was still yeah. new, new highs. Yeah, yeah. unfortunately, well, they and... kind of stopped there, but yeah, yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it, you know, remember it was one of those cases where you had, um, you know, the things that were making new lows. Uh, I mean, to a certain degree, stuff. some of them were like blown up so much that they were, you know. Be listed you know it was like you know there, there were names that you know like, oh we're, we're, we're taking you out of the equation now you're yeah, you're, you're not even being yeah. counted anymore because yeah. uh you know so many of those stocks uh you know i mean they they, they call it the dot-com crash for a reason right you know there were all these names that you know they thought that by putting dot-com you know uh on their on their name that was enough to to say that we've got a business model but they didn't actually have a business model so um yeah that, but that is really interesting i mean I, I i think back to like ebay you know ebay that that bottomed out in 2001 um you know i think netflix was probably coming along uh during that time so you know as, as you mentioned matt there were a lot of these that, that were uh looking strong and you know the the nasdaq we we focus on that a lot and of course the nasdaq was down 79 percent um from its peak in the march of 2000 to its bottom in october of 2002 but um the s p 500 um you know wasn't down nearly as much uh during that time uh it, it was something that was a little bit more nasdaq specific i mean it was it was down but not not as much and the dow jones industrial average hardly showed um much much of a downturn at all during that time so uh, it, it's it's just again i couldn't be more shocked at that that look um and and, and just to be clear uh, you know because sometimes you have to be careful of survivor bias right um uh, does this include everything at that time it's not so i believe like it, i believe it does because this is from uh the data source is from barchart.com so they run this each day and they that's why okay. the data doesn't go before like this starting point is when I spoke with support, they said this is when they started to make this calculation. So it should be survivorship bias free from my understanding. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Very good. Yeah. So um, maybe we can shift over to uh, a MarketSmith tool that we, we sometimes will take a look at. Um, and on MarketSmith, there's uh, a few different market indicator uh, pages that we look at, you know, uh, for, for the NASDAQ, uh, we might look at GMIAB uh, for the New York stock exchange. Uh, we look at, the, the GMIAA and uh, these, you know, these both kind of give you a sense of the advanced decline line, um, you know, for, for, for th those two different things, uh, we, we, we look at those. Um, and then also we look at NASDQ um, for the NASDAQ uh, and that shows this 10 day moving average line of the highs versus the lows. And again, this is gonna be uh, specific to the New York, I mean, the NASDAQ exchange. So right now we're kind of seeing a, a, a similar picture here where the yeah. the new lows have just been dominating. Uh, you know, and again, the 10-day the moving average smooths that out a little bit, but, you know, we had a very brief period in January where the the new highs were above the new lows but that just didn't seem to last very long. Yeah, and, and so I, I think it paints a better picture of the market than the market itself. And, and you know, when I was starting out with technical analysis, I was uh, past president of the Canadian Society of Technical Analysts, and I ran the Montreal chapter when I was, I think I was like 21 or something. Ralph Akampora, who I know was on the show oh, yeah. back in December, <laughs> godfather of technical analysis, founder of the CMT Association. He came down several times, and he was always super great to speak with. I used to love speaking with Ralph. And he came down one time and I had this new software and I was playing with all these oscillators and indicators and I was trying to impress him showing him I know all these different things. And I said, you know, Ralph, what's your favorite tool? He's like, well, he's like, you have the advanced decline line. I said, no, I don't because I didn't have like the breadth data. And he's like, well, that's pretty much the only real important indicator I follow with, with averages. You know, that's kind of the impression. So from that point on, I was like, oh, I really got to put a lot more attention to breadth. And uh, it served me well because, again, it gives a, a great view of what's going on beneath the surface. I think you can see right here with the NASDAQ advanced decline line, uh, it just hasn't participated. It's still before below the February highs. It's like a series yeah. of lower highs in the advanced decline line, which is yeah. just awful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you right there how, how poor this rally has been. And, and again, it kind of tells you how the uh, indexes themselves are maybe masking a little bit of that weakness yeah. underneath. I mean, just as one example, I look at RSP, which is the equal weight of the S&P 500. 
And you know, this is this is showing a different picture. You know, the S and P 500 is above its 50-day moving average line, whereas for RSP, the equal weight, I mean, that looks like it could be hitting resistance at its 50-day moving average line. It's just a very, um, you know, it, it's getting up there, but it's it's not nearly as strong as what the S and P 500 looks like. And, and the S and P, uh, the 50-day moving average is also turning down and a downtrend, right? Which yeah, is kind absolutely. of interesting, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, one thing I've been looking at, and um, now there's so many great ETFs to see these things, but there's, if you look at the QQQ, which is the NASDAQ 100, they also have another ETF now, which is the QQQJ, which is the next generation NASDAQ 100. So it's just mm-hmm. you know, basically oh, wow. stocks 200 to 300. And just stepping down from the first 200 to the next 100 largest stocks, I mean, look at the completely different. Pay- I mean, these are not small cap stocks. They're still like, you know, the 200 biggest stocks on the NASDAQ. Um, the ne- rather the next 100 biggest stocks in the NASDAQ, and what a completely different picture in lack of participation compared yeah. to the QQQ. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think, again, like I'm not someone who wants to make excuses for myself. I'm always a very, uh, you know, kind of critical, I guess, you know, constructively cr- uh, criticism for myself to see what am I doing right or wrong. But sometimes, you know, as investors, we can put like a unwarranted amount of pressure. We say that the market index is doing this, but you have to know your tools. You got to be able to kind of peel back like what exactly is working and, and fine. If, if it's Microsoft, that's great. And if you're a, you know, running a pension fund, maybe, you know, you should have had the right positioning, but if you're looking for like kind of, you know, rock star returns on, on growth names and none of those are really participating. I mean, sometimes, you know, what market are you really in? You know, you need mm-hmm. to kind of sometimes be tough on yourself and sometimes also give, you know, give yourself a, you know, a, Hey, you know, don't worry. It's not the right environment. And that's why the net lows for me, like always looking at that as like, okay, what's the real stock market doing beyond just the top five biggest names? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Are, are you also looking like at the Russell 2000 just to get another <laughs> no, indicator? That's, that's just been hit hard. Yeah. Uh, the Russell 2000. So, um, you know, I, but, I try to not look just too much at the two because sometimes there's periods of times where, you know, just small caps are out of favor in general. Mm-hmm. Um but this time, so, you know, like, I don't want to kind of just like, you know, pigeonhole myself to have to look at these small cap growth. But like I said, looking at QQQJ versus QQQ, I yeah. mean, you're still looking at like at least sizable mid cap stocks up to large cap. And even that's been a total underperformance versus QQ. I mean, we're in the same levels of December. We haven't budged. Mm-hmm. It's like day and night. So um, it's been it's been an incredibly thinly uh, driven rally. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's, it's such a good point um, because. As, as you said, whereas the follow through day uh, is is kind of an event, you know, yeah. what we're seeing here is more what's happening underneath the surface. And um, again, this this gives you a very different picture uh, between those new lows, the the, the next 100 uh, or the equal weight. Uh, a lot of this is just uh, and the advanced decline line, of course, you know, a lot of this is showing a very different picture from um, and, and have you have you. Noticed, I mean, again, I, I really think it's great that you showed us the 2002, 2003. Um, have you noticed any other time periods where you've seen such kind of a dramatic um, difference here, uh, divergence, I guess, in these? in these? Well, you know, clients have asked me the same question, like, hey, Matt, you make it sound like it's such a, a rare thing. Like, have you seen this before? And to be honest, it's a really rare event. Unfortunately, the only times that I, I've seen this kind of dynamic tends to be around market tops. Like if you look at the peak of uh, 2021, that was one of the rare times where you had markets making like new highs and internally you had more lows than mm-hmm. highs already. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I was looking back, I believe it was 2015. We saw a similar dynamic where kind of the NASDAQ in 2015 was sitting that second, that second leg up there in 2015 uh, it was kind of like testing its highs Um but internally was already breaking down. So yeah. it's just extremely uncharacteristic for it to be a real bull market if there's no part. I mean, it, I mean, you can have these short term trends, but to get a persistent trend, how do you do that with five stocks? It would be extremely I, I haven't seen it historically. So that's why I, either we're at a, a point where there's this huge catch up move where I think growth and just everything really catches up with large caps, uh, mega caps, really, or, or, or I think we kind of ease back lower. Um, mm-hmm. it's really that turning point. We need that catalyst to get people interested in buying like the next, the next 4,500 smaller stocks from the top. Uh, the top <laughs> right. of the seven, yeah. you know? well, well, and it also, I, I think it, it does put that caution sign up and, and let you know, okay, until this changes, you know, it's, there's, there's reason to be cautious. Uh, so yeah. again, whether it's a catalyst that makes that happen, or if it's just a process that process that unfolds over time, 
uh, the, the bottom line is that that really has to change. So uh, thanks a lot for sharing these indicators with us. Uh, very, very useful, very useful uh, to, to, to see that. And uh, when we come back, we're going to take a look at some of the stocks that are on Matt's radar. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. The Direction Hydrogen ETF offers exposure to the top 30 pure play hydrogen economy companies by largest market capitalization, leading the way towards net zero emissions by providing more accessible, efficient, sustainable solutions across five hydrogen related sub themes. With clean hydrogen based energy expected to grow five times in the next 30 years, companies building hydrogen related businesses to generate power, heating, transportation, and more will likely thrive. Okay, welcome back to the Investing with IBD podcast. It's Justin Nielsen, your host, along with Arusha Pires from O'Neill Global Advisors. He's a portfolio manager over there. And our special guest this week is Matt Caruso from Caruso Insights. Uh, before we go too much further, Matt, I want to make sure that people know of uh, some of the other places that they can get your insights. Uh, you're definitely active on Twitter. So if you could share that Twitter handle with everyone. So it's uh, at trader underscore M Caruso. Uh, there's my website, carusoinsights.com. And I also have a Substack. I can't remember the, the name right now. I think it's matthew.caruso at Substack or something. So, <laughs> but it's on your Twitter it. handle. If you, if you look it's on my Twitter handle. It should be in the yes. there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So uh, again, a lot of great, uh, I, I have to say, there's a lot of great insights that you share on a regular basis. Yep. Uh, you're one of my go-to uh, Twitter feeds uh, to just kind of, kind of get a sense of what's happening in the market there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some stocks. Um, and we can start with... IOT, uh, some th th this is one that we uh, actually had on Swing Trader for a little bit, and uh, I, I'm kind of ashamed that we didn't put it back on there. Um, but IOT, as as it would suggest, kind of has to do with the Internet of Things, right? What what's what's going on with this company? They they do a lot of interesting stuff. It's actually I think right in line with a lot of uh, emerging trends. So this really um, basically helps companies streamline a lot of their operations. It, they have a lot of devices that bring in analytics from like fleets and operations to you know, to which is good in terms of ESG to you know minimize fuel. It's also good for EPS to uh, maximize profits, uh, and, and so this is really helpful for management to kind of run a more efficient ship. Um, and they're they're doing great. They use like intelligent analytics to recommend uh, better processes or or better ways to kind of manage fleets and activities. And you can see this is a recent IPO, which was kind of um, beat down by the bear market, but starting to come back to life. Um, it's a it's an interesting market cap at about 11 billion, so it's not too much of a small cap. And we've had some really sizable sales growth. We're expecting uh, big forward earnings estimates coming down the pipe. And what I particularly like is that the price action volume profile coming out of that bottom. I think we had eight weeks up in a row with accelerating mm -hmm. volume, and now we're trying to break above uh, the recent highs. Yeah, and mm -hmm. what's uh, what's also kind of interesting with this is there there are already three funds in this. Right, so mm -hmm. a Har Harbor Disruptive Innovation Fund is in this, Invesco, Fidelity Contra Fund. Three of the funds from the IBD Mutual Fund Index are in it already, which uh, I, I think that is uh, pretty impressive for, for a company that just came out public in the last couple of years. Yeah, and I believe uh, Stanley Druckenmiller, uh, you know, there's reports on, on his funds and, and he has uh, an investment in this too. So uh, smart people are, are looking at it. I, I think one of the only negatives is it's, it's been one of the few like, kind of price volume leaders, so many eyes on it, you know, so kind of can succumb to some volatility at times. But uh, if the market's going to improve, I think it's got great price and volume characteristics, uh, a, a great uh, thematic that it's on. Management has a uh, sizable position at 10%, so they, they're going to want to get the share prices moving too. So I, th I could see this being as one of the leaders if this market does get up into gear. Mm -hmm. So as of right now, I mean, the, the sales numbers are pretty good. Um, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, really, really strong double digit growth there. Uh, yeah. Earnings, it's, 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 not, it's not profitable quite yet. So uh, this seems like one of those things where the computer software enterprise, uh, you know, group for a while there, there were a number of stocks where, oh, it just means like, uh, oh, don't worry, the, they're, they're focusing on growth. If they have the revenue numbers, don't worry about the earnings. And that kind of shifted pretty dramatically. Um, you know, it was, it was good from 2018 through 2021, and then 2021, everything shifted. So it, does that give you any concern here? Or is it, hey, this is a newer company, you kind of have to give it that leeway? You know, I think part of that shift is a lot of those software stocks went from being these like early growth stories to more mature. And you know, as you get more mature, 
at some point the earnings have to come because you know you can't really sell the story that oh there's this huge total addressable market as we capture it will become profitable like once you've captured a lot of that addressable market well where's the profits I, I think that's kind of I think the software companies were kind of trained that hey don't worry just grow revenue at all costs and uh, we'll figure out the profits after and then they were reminded that hey look once you get big enough the profits do need to come I know Elon Musk was actually saying something about that similar. Uh, a couple of years ago saying that, hey, if we don't get earnings up, the stock price will eventually get uh, take a beating. But uh, IoT here, I think is a, is a young story with a, a really is a sizable addressable market. A lot of the industrial space has not been kind of brought onto this digital um, uh, framework. Yeah. Uh, so I think they're just really in hyper growth mode. So I, I think that's why they can kind of still live in this this model. They're kind of outside of the traditional kind of software names in that set, uh, industry. And they're more really focused to kind of industrial applications and vehicles, fleet management, et cetera. So I, I think it could possibly get a pass in that regard. Well, it seems like yeah. uh, the, the environment has shifted at least over the last few months to start enable uh, the, where, where software stocks are rewarded a little bit more because a number of these software stocks have started to round out kind of like uh, an IOT right here and are slowly breaking into maybe 52 week highs, not all time highs necessarily because a lot of them got clobbered, but they're all kind of rounding out. So uh, yeah, maybe, maybe the market is kind of shifting back more towards that revenue growth uh, in anticipation that you know, a bull market might be coming around six to nine months from now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think that you're starting to see that shift. It's not totally broad based. A lot of the kind of uh, former software leaders are off their bottoms or kind of stuck right. down there. IoT, I think, yeah. is one of the rare exceptions where you really do see, see this kind of sizable uptrend that's taken hold, which is a little more traditional with growth. So, again, narrow leadership. There are some names, but um, it's narrow, but there are some making headway. So if there is that kind of shift, you can see this really turn into a major leader. And and at least this is one that uh, we could expect, you know, kind of helping those 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 green green areas. At, at least this one's making fifty two week highs. Uh, so, That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, not all time highs as you mentioned, but it is it is making fifty two week highs. Um, how about we shift to another tech uh, leader here? Uh, Arista Networks is one that we've been uh, kind of keeping tabs on. Um, you know, certainly in the computer networking, this is this is one of the giants there, and it's it's pulled back a little bit here to the ten week moving average line, um, mm -hmm. but still seems to be holding up well. And uh, a, a lot of this area did get clobbered. Um, at, you know, we were looking at some of those today. Um, Extreme Networks, um, you know, EXTR was was one that got clobbered today, uh, pretty pretty dramatically. So, what is it that Arista Networks is doing differently, or what's what's making them a leader in your eyes? I think Annette, with their focus on networking, um, I think they're benefiting from the rise of AI. There's, there's there's so much more data that's going back and forth and needs to be done at higher speeds. I think it plays yeah. into a lot of the products that they have. And I think um, part of this rally that's taking place now has been kind of this optimism on AI, which I, I do think will be really revolutionary. I actually had the opportunity a few years back to work with an AI company uh, for within fintech. So I got some really good insights to what is there. And it seems to have grown so much just in the past three years. Um, but I think everyone right now is trying to figure out how can we position ourselves in this like burgeoning trend. There isn't a lot of many very kind of direct plays. So you're seeing NVIDIA kind of move because of their chips, Microsoft and Google, because they, they're trying to incorporate that yeah. into their uh, search engines. I think Annette is partly benefiting from that as well. I think, you know, kind of to, sh you know, spread some optimism where, you know, kind of the first segments today were not terribly optimistic, but I think we've had such a drought in IPOs, yet at the same time, there's so much development going under the surface that's been held back because capital markets have not been conducive to new issues. I think once we finally kind of get past this stage, we're, we're like on the cusp of something that's kind of almost co comparable to the rise of the internet. I mean, AI is going to be revolutionary in so many ways, not just for the companies who develop the technology, but think of the every company that can I implement this technology. I mean, it's going to be cost savings. It's going to be new product offerings, which can hit the bottom line. And um, I, I think there's just so much potential that's building here. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to kind of see like kind of some indirect ways to kind of benefit from that. And I think Annette is one. And the price and uh, volume action, I think, is kind of confirming that. So I'm, I'm watching this as a, a potential leader in the space. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly, I, I think, you know, one of those... One of those things. I mean, this one does have the earnings, um, you know, strong double digit earnings growth, um, even the EPS growth rate. You know, you see that at 18 yeah. percent. Um, but, you know, some pretty good stability there. You know, the earnings stability factor is is 11. Uh, the lower number there is better. So, I mean, 
this is kind of showing some pretty stable earnings too, uh, which is something that you you like to see from a leader. And uh, of course, uh, Arusha is also showing that you've got Fidelity Contra Fund in there. Uh, not only that, but they've they've actually grown their position uh, yep. the last few quarters. You can see that blue uh, in increase there. Um, and you know, I, I mean, this isn't. Uh, uh, this isn't necessarily a recent IPO, but it's it's in the last 10 years, IoT, uh, even more recent than that. So although the IPO market is maybe a little bit stagnant right now, do you think that some of these recent IPOs, because I know Bill used to like look at IPOs from the last eight years and kind of say, hey, here's here's the the ground that you need to look like look at um, is the fact that some of these recent IPOs, I mean, there were so many in 2021. Is this like a time period where it's like, oh, let's see see who of these can now make it and and thrive after after such a great period? Yeah, I think so. I, you know, the IPOs are kind of a a, a tricky you know, proposition. You know, like if we go into a bear market, you know, they usually come out higher valuations and they have a lot of like downside risk. But this is really your best window into into new opportunities, new trends that are going to change the world. And and I so I, I think we're on the cusp of such major things. So I think recent IPOs is a great place to look at. But I think a lot of the recent IPOs are not even on these these kind of newish trends. I think there's just still so much that's developing so quickly. Um, mm-hmm. I'm really keeping my eye out for what what develops there. I think that's going to be really exciting in the next bull market. That's going to really surprise people. Uh, but definitely see with Arista Networks, which I, I, I believe is founded from um, a former kind of Cisco. Uh, right. employee, yeah. um, you know, that just shows again, you know, they left kind of more of a stagnant company, went out and started a new company. And, and here we are at a $48 billion uh, market cap. I think we're going to be seeing that in so many different ways. And my focus is always on the younger stocks. Uh, that's where the action usually is. Yeah. What I always thought it was interesting with Arista was I, I, Cisco sued them. And, okay. I, and that was kind of the overhang. And, and then, you know, once that was kind of resolved, you know, Arista Networks was able to kind of go on its way. So um, it's almost like the next generation Cisco in just because of the speed and stuff like that from their their stuff. So, um, yeah, it's it's definitely one that's worth uh, keeping an eye on and uh, worth uh, might be well positioned. It seems to be well positioned for the whole AI trend. Yeah, I agree. yeah. and there's not, again, not many stocks making new 52 week highs, never mind all time highs, which right. Arista just did this year so. I mean, hey, the, the market definitely sees something there. That's for sure. Yeah. Now, speaking of these younger companies, another one on your radar is Florin Decor, ticker symbol FND. This was an IPO from 2017. And another one that is, um, you know, maybe not at, at all time highs, but it's it's not too far off and uh, uh, looks like it could be, you know, could be at those 52 week highs, just, just about to breach them. Yeah, what I like about this is, you know, um, there's always all this potential or this kind of hype surrounding technology companies, but you know, it's such a, a fast moving landscape. I, I sometimes really still love to have kind of more of like a retail play. They're a little, mm-hmm. they're a little slower moving perhaps, but they seem to be a little more predictable, a little less volatile. And you can really even just see on this chart, how we had that big down leg of the bear market. Then we had a first cup and now we have a, a smaller, tighter cup. So it's kind of very um, uh, characteristic of a, a stock that's kind of like going under accumulation where you're getting, you know, lower and lower volatility as it builds sideways. I think ultimately if the market could move higher, this could be a leader as well. But I, I think they have a, a very interesting um, new new type of offering. Uh, you know, it's kind of more of like a warehouse for everything flooring related. Up until now, it's been kind of more like specialty type of shops. They offer these huge kind of uh, almost kind of becoming like the Costco of, of, of flooring. And uh, they have a lot of uh, interesting advice and help in the store. So I, I think they're really opening up a new uh, niche, just kind of how Home Depot kind of amalgamated, you know, the small electrical shop, the small plumbing shop, all in one space. I think Floor and Decor is kind of trying to do that same thing, but for flooring. So it's, um, yeah. they have a lot of ambitious goals. And I love when a, a company is solid enough where they can kind of apply the cook, cookie cutter method. We're like, okay, this concept works. Do it in this city. Do it in this city. Do mm-hmm. it, and they just kind of, you know, grow it out. It's predictable. Then eventually, even economies of scale work. And and I think institutions like that because the predictability of forward earnings is is a little bit easier. So when the market's right, they tend to trend very nicely. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I've, I've been to, into a few of these stores. I actually own a position in this myself, but um, you know, we, we were, we were looking uh, a number of years ago when we were, when we first bought our house and we were doing a lot of renovations and my wife was just pulling, pulling things off and they have big wide aisles. So you can kind of look at it and, you know, step on it a little bit and see you know, how, wow. how it feels, how it looks. And, um, you know, kind of putting things together with uh, maybe, you know, different swatches of color schemes that you already have in place. So uh, yeah, very interesting. But as you said, there's also a lot of assistance, uh, a lot of, you know, Hey, how can we help? And, you know, do, do you know having everything for the do it yourself or kind of right you know right there uh and uh, yeah that definitely interesting and uh, certainly with the retail i feel like a lot of times it is that kind of expansion as you said when they can find, find a model that works and then boom let's let's just you know expand uh, the stores it's, it's something very interesting but one other thing i just want to point out is um this kind of ancillary strength that we've been seeing in the home builders. Right. Um, and ITB, for instance, uh, is an ETF that is, you know, it's home construction. But when you look at what's in uh, ITB, I mean, you know, you, you have in there floor and decor, Home Depot, Lowe's, you know, a lot of these retail companies. So um, maybe talk about that broader theme of what's happening here with the, the home construction, the retail, uh, not retail, the residential uh, home builders that have been, you know, doing very well lately. Um, anything to kind of glean from that information as well? So this is a bit of a head scratcher for me because you would think with higher rates, obviously, usually a, a lot of kind of home renovation products are, are done with a line of credit or some kind of mortgage, you know, linked um, a debt instrument. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to see this so strong in the face of of the hike in interest rates. Um, I think that maybe just really shows the uh, the underlying demand in this sector. But that you know that kind of uncertainty for me is why I want to pivot within that space. I have seen that strength. I wanted to pivot into a space where I can see like a very clear path to growth, where you're not just mm -hmm. you know yes maybe there's a strong thematic underneath, but I perhaps don't totally understand given the rise in rates. But at least there's a company here that has a, a unique growth strategy, which is almost somewhat independent of the underlying industry. I mean, if they can grow their store count out, even if the industry is kind of stagnant, but they're growing, they can still benefit. So I find it interesting that there is that strength in the group that you bring up. I have seen it, but it's been a bit of a head scratcher. Um, but floor and decor for me is kind of like the best way to kind of uh, walk that line of, 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 you know, playing that group strength, but really a strong individual growth story as well. Yeah, this yeah. is it's it's almost a scenario where you have to, you know, listen to the charts, right? Because there are so many home builders <laughs> that are just setting up so well, and then you have the the ancillary ones like Floor and Decor or a number of other kind of suppliers like BLDR and BLD mm -hmm. acting well. Mm -hmm. There, there's something going on, but sometimes you know the market is looking <laughs> out that six to nine months, yeah. and it's hard to kind of comprehend it. Uh, in in real time, so so this is where you know you do get an advantage with charts, but uh, so, sometimes it might give it, it might just be looking way too far ahead for us to kind of comprehend it. You know, sometimes yeah, too, yeah. It's like we 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 don't fully appreciate the trends. You know, like maybe yeah. some people still are hesitant to travel. Say, hey, look, I'll just stay home and still just work on my home. I mean, maybe we don't really feel it in real time. And looking back, it's always easy saying, oh, what a clear trend. But in real time, it's a little <laughs> more difficult exactly. to see. Yeah. But like you said, that, that's why the charts help. And like it's that two pronged approach to analysis helps to kind of uncover these things. Mm -hmm. Well, and I will say that I, I did talk with uh, we, we, we had some stuff going on with our kitchen. And so we had a guy in, in yesterday and I was I was kind of telling him like because um, he was saying how he works with Toll Brothers and, and Dr. Horton. You know, they, they kind of come in after things are built and if if things need to be fixed afterwards but they don't want to completely scrap the countertop you know a three hundred thousand dollar you know countertop they'll come in and do like little fixes and stuff like that and he was saying one of his thoughts behind it was just the lack of inventory he said mm -hmm. i mean that's that's still a big thing right just now. a housing it's shortage the, right the, yeah there's just uh, yeah. there's just a housing shortage so um you know that that was his guess but again uh i won't i won't attach his name to it you know because i'm not sure if he was uh um cleared to speak on behalf of the company so <laughs> but uh that's one person's opinion uh, so. uh anyway hey matt uh it was great hearing your insights thank you for sharing the indicator uh the new highs new lows and, and for these uh, uh fairly recent ipos that are on your radar so um again uh folks can follow you on twitter 
Uh, take a look at your website, Caruso Insights. Again, a lot of educational material there that is is just awesome. And uh, th thanks as always for just coming on and um, you know laying it all out for us. A pleasure, and I would love talking with you and Arusha, Justin. Thanks for having me on again. Okay, we'll see you again soon. And uh, that's going to be it for us this week. Uh, hope you tune in next week. We're going to have Ken Shreve back on the show. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, old Eagle Eye himself, uh, someone that I've worked with for, gosh, 25 years now. So uh, it'll be a pleasure having uh, this markets reporter, uh, senior markets reporter, back on to kind of lay out all of the stuff that uh, you need to know about IBD. So hope you tune in for that. And thanks a lot for watching us this week. We'll see you next time. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast if you haven't already. We'd really appreciate it. You can also send us your questions and comments to investingpodcast at investors.com. We would love to hear from you and may use your comments on an upcoming episode. Hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching Investors Business Daily on YouTube. If you want to watch more videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a thing.